Hello and welcome to the Overland Journal podcast. I am your host, Scott Brady, and for today, we're going to talk about the principles of overlanding the African continent. Joining me today is Steve Edwards, who has lived in Africa and has traveled around the continent. We also have Graham Bell. Graham Bell was born in South Africa and has quite literally circumnavigated the continent. This wide-ranging conversation includes how to ship your vehicle, how to buy a vehicle locally, the two classic African routes, which would be the East Coast and the West Coast. So we dig into all the details on not only doing a week-long trip in Southern Africa, but also crossing the continent. So please enjoy my conversation with Steve and Graham. This content is brought to you by Overland Journal, our premium quality print publication. The magazine was founded in 2006 with the goal of providing independent equipment and vehicle reviews, along with the most stunning adventures and photography. We care deeply about the countries and cultures we visit and share our experiences freely with our readers. We also have zero advertorial policy and do not accept any advertiser compensation for our reviews. By subscribing to Overland Journal, you're helping to support our employee-owned and veteran-owned publication. Your support also provides resources and funding for content like you are watching or listening to right now. You can subscribe directly on our website at overlandjournal.com. So welcome to the podcast. We have some great guests today. So we have Graham Bell. And Graham, give us, give us a little bit of history of your time on the African continent. Right. Hello. Uh, I was uh, born and raised in uh, South Africa, uh, born in Johannesburg, moved down to Cape Town, spent some time in Durban, kind of moved around South Africa itself a lot, um, and then started traveling overland within the country, and then up to Dar es Salaam 2010, took the kids, packed up a landy and traveled up through Mozambique, Malawi to Tanzania, and after that down across Zambia, Botswana, Namibia, not too much of Botswana. Uh, but we, when we first went left to travel, you know, we were all told by all the local gurus, this was years ago, this was... 14 years ago, but it was like, oh, the sky is going to fall on your head. Sure. You need all this, 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 and this. And we soon realized that it was a very different reality. Um, so after that initial travel up east and across southern Africa, the, the overlanding bug really bit hard. And we set off and circumnavigated South America up to Alaska, around Europe, and then we went again down uh, West Africa, from Portugal over to... Spain, Morocco, down to South Africa again, uh, and then uh, around Southern Africa again. We were trying to drive from Cape Town to Vladivostok in Russia. Sure. Uh, during COVID. A little more challenging right now. Yeah, and it wasn't COVID that actually stopped us. It was yeah. a situation in Ethiopia, yeah, sure. which is still a y problem. Yeah, we need to talk about that in the podcast as well. Yeah. And then we've also got Steve Edwards with us. And Steve, give us a little bit of background on your time on the African continent. Yeah, uh, my wife Julie and I, we lived in uh, Habarone, which is the capital of Botswana, for about two years. Um, and that was our kind of second go around, actually, on the continent. Uh, a few years prior to that, uh, we went to Cape Town for a, like a business conference. And we kind of decided if we're going to fly all the way to 10,000 miles to South Africa, we're not going to just sit in a conference room, you know, all, <laughs> all, sure. all you know, for the whole trip. So um, and we were looking at sort of... Because at that point, we weren't really sort of engaged in the overland life of the, at that moment. And we were looking at, you know, fully catered safari experiences, lodges, that kind of stuff. And, of course, the price tags are, you know, astronomical for those things. And we were feeling kind of discouraged. And then um, I sort of read somewhere about these self-drive safari, uh, self-drive overland experiences that you can do, you know, pretty easily in southern Africa. And we just kind of took a flyer. We booked a Toyota Hilux with a roof tent <laughs> and a fridge. And uh, we started in, in Windhoek in uh, Namibia. And 
we drove out of Windhoek and like 10 miles down the road, the first thing we saw were a bunch of ostriches and warthogs <laughs> running around and there was zebra and we spent our first nights at a, a truly special place called the Namibran Nature Reserve, which is near Sososlai, um, a little bit south of the big sand dunes. Um, and we knew from that first night uh, that this was like some place we needed to come back to. Yeah. Uh, that first night we were there, um, giraffes came and ate from the acacia tree, you know, that we were camped underneath in the middle of the night. And uh, yeah, that was it. Um, and then so we toured Namibia and Botswana um, during that trip. And when we got back to the United States. Uh, we were both kind of in this mindset that we need to find some way to get back there on a more like permanent basis. And so uh, Julie at the time, my wife uh, was an academic and she uh, received a Fulbright fellowship uh, to teach at the University of Botswana in Harare. So that was kind of our, that was the foot in the door. Incredible, um, incredible. And yeah, and then we were supposed to be there for a year, but then they asked if she would stay for one more. And we of course said yes. Uh, and so we, we, had, we were just this amazing privilege to be able to um, not only travel extensively on the continent, I think we traveled about 13 countries in East and Southern Africa, uh, but also to live there, um, yeah. you know, to live there for, you know, many, many months and make friends and, uh, and be able to return to special places, particularly in Botswana. I think we took seven or eight trips to the Central Kalahari Game Reserve, just, just there. Um, and that's, yeah, that, that's our, that's our connection. Um, and, yeah, we were there for about two years, and we've been back in Montana, um, which is our home now for, we came back in 2019. Uh, and I was saying before the pag podcast started uh, how much I miss, how much I miss it. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's really amazing. So, yeah. yeah, my my feelings around trips there is that I'm always so excited to go back because it actually feels like I'm going home. And, and I have heard others describe it similarly, but I think it's because it is a place that most aligns with the things that I find fascinating. It's this huge variety of geology, and it's this huge variety of life, of animal life, and of human life, and of human culture. These are all very ancient things. It's, it's, it's where we came from. So to go back there, I, I just, I remember the first time that I heard a lion roar. And what was so fascinating about it was, it, like, you know, we're, we're higher thinking creatures, and, and I put pieced it together what was happening. But before I pieced it together what was happening intellectually, my body had responded in about seven different ways, including all of the hair that I don't have on my head standing up. Um, and, like, feeling this tension that no, que no question was there from my di long distant ancestors, um, that that noise meant something. It meant a lot of danger. Um, and that has, you know, the ones that lived were the ones that respected that noise and that danger, <laughs> and now it's a part of me. Mm. And it was, it was very, very present with me in that, in that moment. And I, I've just, every trip that I've done there has been an absolute blessing. And, and I've been able to do game drives where you're camping and also game drives where you're staying in a neat lodge and, and uh, raced in, in Morocco in the Outback Challenge and mm. have been back a few other times and crossed the continent from east to west and things like that. But I, I have so much more of the African continent to, see, continent to see. I've really just barely scratched one tenth of one hundredth of one percent of what there is to see in Africa, so I am just an enthusiast uh, believer in the place and in the people that are there, and I'm I'm grateful to be going back very soon uh, for an extended trip up the length of the continent, um, and that's kind of what prompted this opportunity for us all sit to, to sit down. Steve, you were down here, uh, you're a member of our team, you you uh, manage the Expedition Portal editorial, and you were already here for some extended uh, time. Um, and Graham, you're actually on your way up to Tuk 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 in the winter time in the Arctic, um, and you happen to be coming through. So it felt appropriate to have someone that was at least born in Africa, and 
we are also fortunate to have someone who has lived in Africa, and then you have me, who is the total noob, and uh, and and very very grateful for every moment that I've had in that beautiful place. So, so I think the first thing to talk about is really we don't generally just want to say Africa, and the reason for that is it's really <coughs> sh sh not only short sighted from a a language perspective, but it's also very short-sighted from reality. Uh, the, the African continent is absolutely massive. It's the second largest by land mass. You can stuff a whole bunch of North Americas into the size of it. Uh, we decided what there was 54 countries, I think we decided, that was um, either on the continent itself or very close um, as, a, as an island nation. So it is an incredibly diverse place from the Sahara in the north uh, to the, the coca belts in the south and, and just the beautiful places that are in between, including a lot of equatorial jungle um, in the middle. So this is an incredibly diverse continent. And I think the first thing that I wanted to ask you, Graham, having grown up there, when you, when you learned about the history of your country and uh, of this continent, what are the things that stand out as being most notable about the African continent to you? I think being born and raised mostly in uh, apartheid South Africa, it was actually very difficult to get a greater understanding of the African continent because of the nature of their education system. Mm. Um, it wasn't like we were being taught broad African history in school. We were taught South African history um, with a focus on colonialism and the conflicts with the Zulus, etc. Um, but I actually felt when I was, as an adult, traveling into Africa, the f Africa proper yeah. from South Africa, the first time um, that I actually knew nothing about the continent. Mm -hmm. I knew a bit of history, I'd done my reading, uh, but it was a bit of a blank slate for me and I had to kind of go and discover it for myself. And I think that was a large part of, of why we traveled and how we traveled, is that we wanted to discover it for ourselves. Um, and we were surprised by what we found. Mm. But the history of, of Africa, the recent history and the forming history, which made it what it is today is uh, the colonialism. And that's the colonialism that created those 54 countries. Uh, before they weren't countries, they were tribes. Yeah. And, and half of the, the tragedy of the recent history of, of Africa is you have these lines drawn on a map by people sitting in Brussels. Yeah who have no idea that that river separates that tribe from that tribe or that mountain range is, you know, th there's just so much complexity to the entire tribal system and, and then try the, the then political system. Yeah. And it was just arbitrary drawn up, the lines were drawn up. And that's a lot of the conflict and a lot of the problems that Africa faces is because of those those arbitrary lines. Yeah, there were powerful kingdoms that right. existed. Right. I mean, huge kingdoms of people with kings and militaries and complex, uh, even political arrangements with other kingdoms that were near them. Um, and yes, so the, the lines were drawn ar arbitrarily that oftentimes cut through those original, those original kingdom lands. And the, the history, it's... At the written history, it's, it's difficult, I think, from, from our perspective to, to truly understand the history of the continent and all its, its, its various facets because of the written history is not quite um, as, as it is with Europe, for instance. But there's, I mean, it's And it probably misses a bunch of really important details. Right, yeah. right. Like, for instance, there was a, um, the, the bit of history that we, 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 we can access, there's some fascinating stuff. There was a, a king from Mali who even by today's standards would still be considered the richest man in the world. And he traveled to Egypt and he took so much gold with him and he gave so much away that it actually devalued gold as a currency in Egypt. Um, you know, the, the languages that the people spoke, the complexity of their societies, I think they're underestimated and they're not appreciated mm. enough by all of us. Mm. Um, and those are things that you can see as you travel through. Uh, you know, you can see echoes of the past, but you can see the reality of the future as well, which both of those, are, to me, are quite fascinating. Well, and, and in even the, the, the stories that you hear that in Ethiopia, there is some island that 
supposedly contains the Ark of the Covenant. Right. So e even Western history um, and Western or Eastern religions, Western history, Christianity has a, a, a very significant, at least, uh, potential footprint. Right, uh, and, that's, and that's, again, so. that's looking at, as you travel through the country, uh, through the continent, sorry, you, you'll see this. I mean, East Africa, massive Arab influence. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that goes from the religion to the, the, the style of dress to the language to the forts on Zanzibar. And, you know, yeah. there's, there's so much of that. And then you have the Portuguese influence and, and the Spanish influence on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, everything that's north of the Sahara is not what people understand to be Africa. That's right. You know, um, and all that's quite fascinating. It is quite fascinating. So, Graham, when you, when you think about traveling like you have done, doing these big cross-continent trips, I mean, the one that you did up the West Coast uh, qualifies as an expedition in my mind in every term. These are very significant endeavors. What, do you, what would you say are the most important considerations when you look, especially to go up the West Coast of Africa? For context, for those that are listening, uh, to go up the western route of Africa is it includes about three times more countries than to go up the east side, um, and the infrastructure is significantly different. Um, there are places where there are paved roads, absolutely, but there are long distances that need to be traveled uh, without uh, a paved road. Whereas the eastern route is the most traveled, and it also is where most of the over-the-road commerce occurs. Uh, there's, there tends to be a little bit more stability, which means there's more commerce. When there's more commerce, there's more infrastructure, which includes being able to drive on tar for the entire length of Africa other than a short ferry ride into Egypt. So they're, they're very different, the two routes. And you've done them both. Um, so that's, it, for me, it's very interesting to think about the more challenging route is definitely the Western route. Um, what are some things that you would recommend people consider before even attempting that? Well, <clears throat> the Western route is without a doubt, um, it can be precarious, it can be dangerous, it can be very, very difficult. Uh, the bureaucracy is one of the first hurdles. I think it was 17 countries we had to go through, and even though we have South African passports, we still needed visas for most of those countries. And to get those visas, you have to dry, travel to the capital city of the country before that country, um, and that entails a lot of logistics, then it's the expense of the visas. It's waiting for the visas. It's hoping that you get the visa. Sure. It's hoping that the visa is valid when you get to the border of that next country. It's, sure. Um, so it's a bureaucratic challenge um, to travel to those countries. You have uh, a mix of languages as well. You have French, English, Portuguese. Uh, then you have the climate itself, depending on what time of year you go. It's always going to be hot. Sometimes it's hotter than others. You might have the Harmattan winds that are coming down from Morocco, yeah. carrying all that dust from the Sahara. Mm. You are going to get ill. It's guaranteed. And the roads are absolutely terrible in most of those countries. Yeah. And, and sometimes they're barely, they barely qualify yeah, exactly. for the road. And it's, and it's connecting countries, you know, yeah, you're driving sure. this tr goat track. Yeah. You're like, are we on the right road? <laughs> um, but the point, when it, it kind of all comes together, though, when it's hot, it's dusty, there's no road to speak of, you're ill, um, the vehicle's breaking down, and you've got this bureaucracy ahead of you, and you don't know if you're going to cross that border. Um, all of these things combined make it a very, very um, challenging route. And I believe it's the last great overland route um, because of all those challenges. Mm -hmm. it's yeah, so it, very similar to the Silk Road. Right. But, but I don't think on the Silk Road you're probably not getting stopped 20, 25 times a day by a military. Um, yeah. yeah. That, that you experience. <laughs> but you don't – I would say that the difference is, is that the – from what I understand, which I have not done the West Coast route of Africa. And I haven't done the Silk Road. Just but the, um, the one significant difference is the quality of the roads. I mean, you, you do drive on Jeep tracks when you're going through um, some of the stands. I mean, they're very, you're, you're in low range and right. picking your way over rocks and things like that. But um, that is very different from a goat track that's covered in mud. Right. <laughs> uh, and it's so got a military 
um, checkpoint on it. You, yeah. you know you're on the right route when somebody steps in front of you with an AK. You're yeah. like, oh, okay, now they're on, <laughs> on the right route. <laughs> Who needs a GPS? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just follow the sound of gunfire. Yeah. Well, no, well, no, no, I'm kidding. No, we only had that once, and it was a very bad situation as well. Um, yeah, <clears throat> I think it's... I've, I've tried to warn people that, that they... Half the problem is I think you get a lot of overland travelers that overbold uh, or oversell certain routes, and then they're like, oh, this is really dangerous. And they're trying to make it a bit more hardcore than it seems. Um, West Africa is every bit as hardcore as, as its reputation says it is. Um, you can't go lightly into it. Uh, you will be tested. And uh, a lot of people actually turn back eventually. It just gets too much. Uh, so I think the number one thing you have to you know, prepare is your mind. You have to be mentally prepared and you have to stay the course and you have to stay patient and strong. Um, maybe maybe remind yourself that that's what you wanted right. as a challenge, <laughs> was right. to experience something, because life is short, so right. why not do hard things? Right, and the reality is once you get deep enough into it, there's no way out. Yeah, you other than forward, way, yeah. yeah. Other way, or either all the way back or all the way down and keep going. Um, but because it is such a challenge, it is so incredibly rewarding, you know, uh, because you had, there are so many obstacles and you're tested in every way. By the end of the journey, you are exhausted and elated. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's this almost euphoria. Yeah. When you what? roll into Angola, Man. <laughs> yeah, because Angola has actually gotten a lot easier. So, mm -hmm. you know, 15 years ago, Angola was a challenge even to get into. Right. Um, and now they've got good roads in Angola and a lot of development. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's been interesting to see how, well, that is Africa. Things change. Right. Some countries come into, into success and wealth and resources, and then, you know, then a cycle can hit that can take those things away mm. right and the mm. technological advances i think have been absolutely amazing for africa and it's going to be even better um whereas before the just the geography is and, and obviously the the economies have been restrictive in terms of infrastructure but now you have cellular networks yeah. now you have starlink that's yeah. spreading all the way through africa yeah and i expect that you're going to see that it's there's going to be some very very significant changes on the continent mm not only for the people that live there, but also for the travelers. Yeah. And most of it, I think, is going to be overwhelmingly positive. Yeah. Well, improving communications tends to improve a lot of things. Mm. So mm. when you were traveling that route, what are uh, a story or two that comes to mind that was the most, um, that was the most memorable for whate whatever, whatever that may be? I think that would be um, the build-up to and the crossing from Nigeria into Cameroon, which I think I've also talked about you about yeah. before. Um, but basically, it was four days in low range in the highlands of Nigeria, the most beautiful countryside you've ever seen in your life. Um, just mud and little villages and uh, then popping down into Cameroon and doing these river crossings and more mud, 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 and then yeah, just the most beautiful people and the most beautiful country that we emerged into. Um, that was an amazing part of the journey for me and something I would literally, I would like to go back just to do that part of that again. Unfortunately, before we went into that area on the Nigerian side, there'd been a murder outside our camp. We had armed, men's com armed, armed men coming into our, I say camp, but it was a compound, a hotel compound. Armed men coming in. Um, it was a kidnapping zone. It, it was extremely di uh, dangerous and difficult situation. Uh, so, th th yeah, that to me is pretty much uh, it's that's unforgettable when you when you yeah. find yourself with your family in that kind of situation, and you just I, I we were all ill, and we had that going on. And we thought, oh man, I just I don't know if we can take this anymore. And then the next day, it all just became beautiful. Yeah, and and we went from. Uh, the depths of almost despair to to elation, yeah, all within forty eight hours. Sounds like adventure. No, it sure was. <laughs> <laughs> and then, did you go through Gabon at all, or did you go right into the D into the Republic of Congo to get through? Gabon is amazing. Mm. Okay, so you did Gabon do that. Gabon is beautiful. Yeah, we are, we spoke in Gabon. Yeah, we. Uh, right. I managed to get 
I don't know, a satellite or something. Yeah. We, I know we, we spoke of it. Yeah, Gabon is absolutely amazing. Beautiful, beautiful country. Uh, very good road network, at least north to south. Um, wonderful country. Yeah. And very sparsely populated. Yeah. And then you went into the Republican, the Republic of Congo, kind of along the coast. Then, yeah, I, I have to remember. Uh, basically, there's a enclave uh, of Angola called Cabinda. I see that here. Yeah. Yeah, and we had to get into Cabinda, and then there's a little strip of the DRC. I see that that you have to go through to get into Angola proper. Very small. Yeah. Now, you, you, they call it the N1. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll show you some photos think, uh, of the N1. Yeah, right. Um, and what's interesting about that, we had gotten the visa for the DRC, I think, in Benin, and there were all these rumors going around that the guy, the, the, the consular head who was issuing the visas, was actually corrupt. Okay, and the yeah. visas weren't legit. So, if you're in Cabinda. And if they won't let you into the DRC, you can't get into Angola. There's no way out. You either have to drive all the way back up to Europe, all right, or maybe fork out 10,000 bucks to get your vehicle on a DC-10 or something. Sure. Um, or whatever. But that... It's going to cost point, you a lot of yeah, money yeah, 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 to yeah. fix that problem. The stress yeah. we had on that border. Yeah, we sat sure. there for 24 hours. And eventually, uh, we, yeah, it was all fine. It was all taken care of. But yeah, that was, that was hardcore. Oh, that's an amazing. Now, talk about um, the roads, because I, I, I've seen that in some of Dan Greck's stuff, too. And, I mean, it, it looks like low range, like if you, you, you probably wished you had seven diff locks, but, like, it looked, some of the stuff that you went through looked incredibly challenging. Luckily, I was driving a Defender, mm. right? Um, and we had some really, really bad jungle roads, really, really muddy roads, uh, river crossings that uh, were quite challenging. There was a lot of that. But that was the fun stuff. Yeah, sure. That was the stuff you look forward to. That's sure. what you enjoy driving. The majority was um, either jungle track um, or just pothole tar, yeah. tarmac that was laid yes. by whichever colonial power was there 40 years before. Sure. And it hasn't been maintained since. Sure. And all the potholes grow in the shade. <laughs> they do. And you'd, so you'd finally get into third gear, and then you'd... Wham! There's a, there's a, exactly. <laughs> there's a big tree. Boom! And you and boom. And it's just all day. Yeah. You're rocking. You're smacking in potholes. Uh, it, yeah, it's a challenge. It's a real challenge. Uh, when you get to a decent piece of, piece of tarmac, that's like heaven. It, that's so like it is. It is. It's so funny how when you finally hit it, it's like you feel like your heart rate drops by twenty beats a minute. Right. Yeah, and you and like all of a sudden, then you hear all the squeaks in the car. Right. And you're like, oh, what's what is that clattering? That, that, that what's broken? You can actually hear it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we had a lot of that where you you get onto the dirt road, and you like you start you enjoying it. And then after a while, it's just, man, I just yeah. really want to get into tarmac. And then you get onto the tarmac, and you're like, you missed the dirt road. <laughs> yeah. Unless you're in Namibia, where they have somehow have made the best dirt roads on the planet. Yeah. Like, I think I think the best car for Namibia would be a, a Subaru WRX. Probably. Because, <laughs> <Probably. laughs> like, I would like to spend the entire time sideways on a <laughs> Namibian road. Right. I mean, they are so, they're beautifully crowned, wide, graded. You know, right. they just skip the whole terrible tar and just went with really well-maintained dirt roads right we were there in during covid and i, I think the um the greater guy you know was forced to stay at home or something <laughs> it was corrugated like was it? Uh, <laughs> yeah. all those farmers that live out there in the middle of nowhere they travel there's hiluxes where they fully pump tires yeah at 75 miles an hour on a dirt road yeah they're not even touching the ground yeah they're just floating skipping over right over the top <laughs> yeah you try that with a fully loaded defender <laughs> no, no. yeah yeah so. it's unbelievable yeah i drove the last time i was in namibia i was driving the new defender of course like beautiful airbag suspension mm -hmm. independent you know suspension on every corner aired down tires it was literally like a magic carpet i mean it was a rally car on those roads for right. sure yeah it was it was the right car for those those kinds of roads for sure i'd be and interested to see sorry how the new defender would handle like the west african route 
you know, the, the challenge is just the complexity. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's going to be it's going to be amazing until something some complex component of the suspension fails, a, a sensor or a height sensor or an airbag or mm -hmm. a stick comes up and punctures the airbag. Um, but but driving even over Venzels and all that, we did that all in a stock 110 mm -hmm. and it was just effortless, absolutely effortless. So it can handle the technical terrain, it's but it's maybe it's a, a long duration over very technical and difficult. It's a difference terrain. between capability and durability. Right. So if you if you look at a, a Jeep Wrangler, very high on the capability range, low capacity, low payload, low uh, low durability, because the components are really designed for a lightweight recreational vehicle. Uh, whereas your Defender is designed to carry 3,000 pounds of stuff. Mm. So it's it's much more durable. Mm. Right. Yeah. Or, or a Land Cruiser is another good example of that. Less capable, more durable. Than a Defender is uh, capable. Uh, yeah, yeah, they're similar. They're, right. just, they're just different. Uh, right. The Defender has better articulation, mm. but the Land Cruiser has diff locks. So if you're in a Land Cruiser without diff locks, the Defender will do better for right. sure. For sure, but those that you know, that's you know, that's all. That's Driver those are over, those, well. <laughs> those are all those are all those are best. Those are conversations best had over a beer. Right. <laughs> because right. because <laughs> to say to say that a you know, give me a good driver and uh, yeah, and a and a samurai any day of the week uh, over any of those cars. That's what I love about driving in Africa. You'll you'll be up on the that low range yeah. four day pass up yeah. in Nigeria, yeah. and you'll be like, yeah, we're in the thick of it now. This is why you drive a four by four. This is why you drive a mm. Defender, and then the local comes along in a Tercel, thirty-year-old yeah. Peugeot, Peugeot. Yeah. With family <laughs> yeah. in the back, and like the roof loaded up, and off he goes. It's just no big deal. Yeah, yeah. the power of local knowledge. Right. Yeah, we were. I can't remember. <laughs> we were somewhere super deep in Uganda. Same thing. G wagons, low range, rear diff locks on, creeping up this trail and literally a Toyota Corolla right. comes around and uh -huh. everybody hops out yep. so they get the weight out of it and then it starts up the trail and pe people are pushing push, and, push, push, and then and they made it right up no like like they well they probably had done it a hundred times right. and it was just it just wasn't a big deal but oh, we like to feel like we're special but we are <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. Uh, I wouldn't I, w I mean if I was driving on my own with a couple of buddies I'd take a Toyota Corolla but I'm not going to take my family yeah of course of course but I think that also speaks to the reality of these roads on these um, across those countries especially like West Africa where uh, you'll have large sections, l m the vast majority of that road is is going to be fine. It's yeah. not going to be great. It's not going to be uh, pleasant. Uh, but you only really need that 4x4 capability, et cetera, for a very small part of it. Uh, but it makes a big difference when you get to it that you yeah. can get through it without having to depend on other people. And sometimes it's even just getting off of ferries. I've, I've, it's like mm. some of the more challenging conditions that I've experienced with heavily loaded overland vehicles is getting up the dirt ramp because right. it's usually muddy and there's been a lot of ruts mm. and the locals just choose to hit it at Mach 10. Right. You know, they hit it, they're in third gear by the time they're on the dirt, um, you know, and they're smashing through. It, it, you know, even getting up the banks of those rivers can be quite challenging when, right. you're, when you do those ferry crossings. So, well, let's, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about logistics so traditionally, traveling by vehicle around Africa has been best done with a Carnet de Passage. Mm. And that is still <laughs> considered best practice, but that's slowly changing because of people like Dan Greck. And I don't know if you traveled on a Carnet. You may have not needed to with it being a South African vehicle, but did you travel on a Carnet? We chose to. Yeah. Um, I think the first note there should be as well is that the AA is very reliable in terms of a, um, a logistical source, you know, as a bureaucratic entity. We had a carnet years ago that we, we never got the deposit back for, but the carnet had expired. We got another carnet in Senegal, and then when we returned to South Africa, they gave us both our deposits back. You know, so something like that in an organization is great where they have this kind of you know, there's this uh, integrity. There is and an accountability behind an accountability it. Accountability, mm -hmm. and they switched on your. You know, they. It's the bureaucracy is good. The carnet for me is. Uh, it's useful. 
Yeah. It's really useful. You know, some countries, for instance, Senegal, there's one border crossing where they absolutely insist on a on a, a carnet, um, or they'll fine you, or they'll detain you, this and the other. The other option is to drive a really bad road, 800 kilometers around to go to the other border po uh, post where they don't worry about it. You know, so <clears throat> and then you get to some border po crossings where you can sit forever to try and get your TIP done, or you can literally just walk up the car and, and you're out. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. We, we just, for Africa travel, we just, we, the first time we went around, we used a carne, and the second time down, we used a carne as well. We just found it to be uh, a lot easier. Yeah, I, that's what I'm, I'm going to travel on a carne. Yeah. So I do, I mean, I, I think it's, it's so, it is so admirable that, that Dan decided to try to do it on a tip the entire time right and that's pretty impressive um and i mean so that's he's he's very much um a trailblazer in i mean i'm sure others have done that i'm not giving him exclusive acknowledgement of what he accomplished but it it certainly showed people that there's a possibility to do this a little bit different mm -hmm. um, but there are countries in the world where you simply cannot get in without a carnet so right. um, you want to go into mongolia you're you got to have a carnet period Right, so Iran, Saudi Arabia, yeah, Egypt. Of course. Uh, yeah, Egypt. Mm -hmm. I yeah. mean, uh, Dan went through Egypt without the coronavirus. He, man he managed to figure that out, yeah. Yeah, there was uh, a bit of a bakshish thing going on yeah, here or so. there. But I think so, but um, yeah, as far as I know, at least in recent memory, he's given the length and breadth of his trip. Um, managing to do that was pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, and we only traveled on TIPs also, but we had kind of a different traveling situation. Um, you know, we were we had a home base, right? Sure. Um, and uh, the countries we traveled in were not uh, sort of a huge challenge um, to get in and out of um, without you know without a carnet. Um, there was some, say for example, uh, Kenya, um, Tanzania. The TIPs are pretty short um, for uh, for tourists. So uh, I think Tanzania was only seven days when we mm. were traveling there. So. You know, it does kind of delimit a little bit what you can do. Like if you want to stay for a longer time, um, you can often get those TIPs, the temporary import permits, extended. Uh, but again, you need to go to Dar es Salaam and sit in a line at a you know at a customs office, and, um, and nobody wants to do that. No, no. Um, so, and then I understand, and oftentimes it's also like super in flux right now too. So, for example, um, right now. Um, I think the transit uh, TIPs in Kenya are only a few days now. So Kenya is basically requiring a carnet at this point. Um, and then I'm sure we can talk a little bit about what's the situation in Ethiopia. Um, yeah, I think that'll be important. When we talk about the, east, the eastern route. But, um, you know, these things change too, right? Uh, they're not set in stone. Um, and I think particularly where uh, you see some political instability or like in West Africa where the bureaucracies are um, really opaque. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, there's a lot of op opaque bureaucracy in Africa in general, but um, uh, you know, it can change on a, a wide variety of levels from the policy level at, you know, uh, you know, within the government to whoever happens to be manning the customs desk at that particular border that particular day. Um, and that's one of the, one of the things that, makes Africa travel, <laughs> Africa travel, um, whether you're on the East Coast or on the West Coast is, um, yeah, sort of preparing yourself mentally for those, uh, those variables. Uh, and, and preparing yourself mentally that it, that the variables that you know today will change. Yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly. Governments even can change. Yeah, so always in flux. Um, yeah. But he who has the most paperwork wins, <laughs> <laughs> right? So we always carry a folder. Yeah. That's yeah. Got we do too. Everything going back forever. Yeah. yeah. And as soon as they, st you know, you, you like you get the wrong person on the wrong day, and they start with the this and the that, then you just go, "What paper are you looking for?" Da, da, da. I've got it here somewhere, and you just yeah. burn time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And eventually, mm -hmm. you might actually find what they're looking for. Yeah, sure. Um, but yeah, I think uh, the TIP um, generally it's easier to get. The carnet makes life a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. But in general, having as much paperwork as possible, making sure that everything is up to date and everything's done. It's frustrating when you watch the locals lift the boom and go through on their <laughs> own, right? That are, and you, you're sitting there for three days to try and get over the border. Um, well, and there's there are travelers that have done that too. 
they lift the boom and or they drive through and then they kind of walk around for a little while and they right. drive away. Yeah, I wouldn't do that. Nope. But <laughs> it when you get to the next border, <laughs> it, hap- <laughs> yeah. it, it happens a lot. Yeah. Right. It happens a lot. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But yeah, we we did that too. Uh, and this is this is, I mean, I think fine advice too if you're traveling in Central Asia or Central America. We we had this big accordion, plastic accordion binder, right, and just filled with, I don't know, dozens and hundreds of pages of, of paperwork and all easily labeled and, you know, extra copies and all extra those. copies. Yeah. And by the time you know we were done with our travels, like I knew exactly, I could close my eyes and stick my hand in the folder and pull out the, you know, pull out the right, the right piece of paper at the right time. And there's also something of a. There's a there's a confidence thing at the border as well that kind of sometimes makes your life easier where you're being bullied by touts and people who want to you know whatever guard your vehicle or you know help you through customs or you know they want to help you right um, but you know if you got a big fat binder in, under your arm and you walk purposefully and you, know, you can uh, do those sorts of things it um, it sometimes makes things easier even if you don't know what you're doing uh, yeah you pretend that you do it, yeah exactly <laughs> goes walking a with a little bit of purpose yeah, and right. intention <laughs> now talking about documentation it is it's really that folder that binder that you have is not something that should be taken lightly it shouldn't be something that's just kind of stuck up in the <laughs> in the in the little cubby above the above the sun visor this needs to be in a secure place in the vehicle preferably locked up um, and it needs to be treated with a great deal of care and respect because losing those documents is oftentimes an enormous inconvenience and I'm going to speak about like my own failure in this regard that was nearly um, like about as bad as it can get so I was jet lagged came into Cape Town, we were getting the Land Cruiser ready to fly it to Antarctica, the most difficult part of Expedition 7, logistically. And I was in the hotel, I had had breakfast, and I was going through paperwork, exhausted. And I got up and I go back to my room, and I, you know, getting packed up for things, and I I don't know where the binder is. And I'm thinking about the last time that I had it, and... It was in this little cafe in the in the hotel, and I mean this is it's such a pro it's such a problem. It was literally that's the worst been, feeling. It would have been <laughs> yeah. It's probably in my entire life. It is probably the moment that I felt the greatest dread, mm. like that that if if the next couple steps don't start to align in a positive way very quickly, an enormous amount of effort would have will unwind itself. And it'll be, you know, about as tragic of an outcome, and all things considered, right? In the fact that this right. is, I'm on an adventure right. of, of my choosing, but as far as it's the, not just you though, there's a yeah, whole team that you're going to be holding there's back. There's all these people that were waiting and everything else like that. And the vehicle is getting ready to get put on a plane and everything else. And I go back down there; it's gone. It is not. It's not in the booth. It's not. It's nowhere to be seen. And I'm asking. Uh, the people that are there, if they have seen it and they don't have any idea. And I asked if the manager of the restaurant was there and like, no, he's, he's, he was somewhere else. I said, and I, and I, I did this, I took a hundred dollar bill out of my pocket and I said, I need to find this folder. Can you guys help me make that happen? And there was all of a sudden an enormous amount of attention (laughs) paid to my problem. And they call the manager and the manager they, they they were very um, enthusiastic about him coming back, and he comes back and I explain what happens. He's like, and he gets this smile on his face, and he reaches down into this bottom drawer and he opens it up, and there was the folder, oh my and it was the best hundred dollars I've ever spent. Bucks you ever spent. I have ever spent in my entire life. <laughs> so, l- learning from my mistake, which was a really f- that was a rookie foolish thing that I did, was not keeping track of, you know, let's keep track of our passports. Let's never put our passports in a jacket should always be in our first layer of clothing, always on our person. Um, losing your passport and all those visas, it's a huge problem if that happens. Mm-hmm. And it's the same thing with our vehicle documentation and our carnet, which was in the folder. Um, and so learn from my mistake is to keep those things where they should be, keep them under your control uh, so that you don't lose them. Because I've heard the stories of the people who have and trying to unwind those problems is really, really difficult. So we not only want to keep good control of our documentation, but we also want to have 
lots of extra copies of all of those of all of those documents. And when you get to a place, a hotel or whatever, that happens to have a copy machine, make copies of all of the documents that you just got at the other borders. But before you even do that, when, you're, when you've gotten through the border and you're sitting there, you've made it through, you got all your paperwork, and you're pulled off and you're kind of stopping or maybe you're gonna have a cup of tea, grab your phone, take a picture of every single document that you just got. Every single thing you got, the, the, the little insurance card, uh, the one that, that says this is you paid the tax for the road stuff and the, uh, the, the, uh, the signatures in the carnet. Take a picture of all that on your phone. Most places have data still and you can upload all that to the cloud and now you've got a full copy. So doing that, having extra copies digitally, extra, extra physical copies, uh, it's amazing how much that solves problems mm -hmm. at these borders. And there is a lot of bureaucracy. Uh, when you're traveling through these countries, I experienced it going into South Sudan and Uganda and and those really remote borders in Kenya and Uganda, mm -hmm. um, where you got you got to have your documentation in order. They're wonderful people. I did not have a single bad experience. Um, if you treat them with a smile and you you have a little bit of humor and you acknowledge their position of authority, which is only fair, we do that with 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 uh, with the people in our own governments. We give them that deference. Uh, it's amazing how smooth those things can go, but you want to make sure you have your documentation in order. Absolutely. Mm. And look at it as part of the adventure. Mm -hmm. The grumpy overlander mm -hmm. that shows up to the... Th th they're always complaining about the border crossings. I'm like, no wonder. <laughs> like, why are you even here? Why are you doing this? You seem so incredibly unhappy about the entire yeah. process. It's yeah. like, it's... Like, you didn't think it was going to be tough? Of course it's going to be tough. Put a smile on your face. Let's make it a game. Let's have fun with it. Border day can be stressful. But we always looked forward to it because we also knew that it was on to a new chapter in the yeah. adventure, right? And um, borders are just these incredible places of, like, cultural exchange, and yeah. linguistic exchange, and they're a liminal space, right, between one one sphere and another. Yeah. And there's there's no, no, no place like that. And... Um, we've met so many other travelers at border posts, right? Um, other overlanders, other other travelers from all over the world, um, you know, and exchange of information, exchange yeah. of information, sure. and just you know that shared experience that you're having, and totally, um, and yeah, we've had some extremely stressful and like anger-inducing days at the border, um, and. You know, traveling as a couple, with my wife Julie and I, uh, we tend to ha we have very different personalities. So, Julie, uh, she wants to get stuff done, um, and you know, when the time calls for someone who's going to be really insistent and really uh, sort of, you know, going to put their foot down, it's Julie's turn to work. <laughs> <laughs> work her magic. Yeah. But when you know it's time for the glad handing and the jokes and the uh, the patience, right? That's yeah. where I, that's where I come in, and so. Yeah especially if you're traveling in a group or you're traveling with, with your significant other, sort of understanding like your, your different personalities and yeah. like, what you need from the situation um, you know, is also good. There's that self-awareness. Yeah. Um, because those things really, I think, bubble up mostly at, at, at border crossings. Um, and educating yeah. the people that you travel with that you are only to answer specifically mm. the question that was asked. Mm. Right. I have seen shocking <laughs> volunteering, <information>. volunteering of information. <laughs> at border crossings where I'm looking over at the person and he's talking about, well, this engine, you know, I actually got it out of, and like they ask him for the VIN. He's All like, right. you know, I actually don't have the motor thing. And they didn't ask for the motor number, <laughs> like, yeah. you know? So, so yeah, when they ask you a question, uh, very short response right. with yeah. a smile, yeah. uh, specifically what they're asking and right. nothing more right. because right. why even open up Pandora's <laughs> box when you do that? I, right. still, I still get border anxiety after all these years, mm. every single border, I have border anxiety. Of course. And half of that is, is that the country you're coming from, you had that anxiety when you entered it, mm. but then you get relaxed and you realize it's actually pretty cool. I'm having a good time. Yeah, you get chilled out, relaxed, and everything's good. And then like, oh no, another border, what's gonna be like on the <laughs> other side? And mm -hmm. yeah, I, but um, yeah, lucky that it's speaking about strengths. Uh, Louisa is the border person. Mm. She's the one who's got the paperwork, this and the other. I just trail along with the kids and sign because things are in my name and I'll sign and I'll like smile and act stupid. Um, <coughs> and I, I, that's do you feel that the kids help with that process, having a family there? I think it, 
Hmm. It, it kind of leads into a point I wanted to get into maybe a little bit later, but also there's that Africa tends to be, and Africans tend to be quite conservative. Um, and they qu- tend to be quite family oriented. Um, and so if you're showing up at the border, you're well dressed, you've got long pants on, you've got trousers, you've got a, a collared yeah. shirt, you're a family, you're respectable, you're organized, they respect that and they'll yeah. give you that respect and you'll respect them. There's mm-hmm. this For sure. cycle that kind of works there. And I think it always has helped that we travel with the kids because people immediately see the kids and then they think family. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Family is not going to be doing 90% of the things other than overstaying visas yeah. and things like that because yeah. some countries that's popular for families to go in. And, yeah, sure. Um, so then have a look at your passport. But yeah, I mean, we had it uh, coming into the US mm-hmm. once. They came and they actually planted a box full of narcotics on our Land Rover to train a dog. Um, that's terrifying. Right. <laughs> I'm like, are we cool here, guys? Is everything all right? But it was the cops. This is how a it. really bad movie starts. Right. Like, yeah. right. We're just going to plant this drugs yeah. on your... It's going to be okay. <laughs> it's going to be fine. <laughs> but uh, it's because we had the kids. Yeah, so sure. these guys are looking at everyone coming in today. Who's the, who are the people that are the least likely to be breaking the rule? It's the people in the Defender with the yeah. family, yeah, with the kids. Sure. Um, yeah. So I think it does, it does make a difference to have the children. And I think, I think you're... I think you're your point is well taken too, just in terms of thinking about doing your research, uh, because it, like we opened the podcast with, in terms of, you know, we can't just say Africa, right? Like it, if you're like going into Malawi or if you're driving into Gabon or wherever, having some foreknowledge of understanding, you know, A, not only their bureaucracy at the border, but B, a little bit about like the cultural context yeah. right because yes it's not appropriate for even a man to be wearing shorts exactly so like the cultural you know differences they are vast and multitudes um in africa and yeah uh, just understanding that and most cultures um like you're saying are pretty conservative they're high context cultures so understanding what's going on at any one time in your social interactions um stuff that you know maybe North Americans or South Africans um, might be completely oblivious to uh, are extremely important um, for other folks, right? And I mean, that goes across the, the globe, right? But sort of preparing yourself a little bit for that um, and, you know, uh, handshakes and smiles and, and respect go a long way. Yeah, and and you're a guest. You're a guest. Exactly. They don't, you, you know, they don't owe you anything. Mm-hmm. They don't have to let you in their country. Mm-hmm. You're asking permission mm-hmm. and you are a guest of their country. Yeah. So being mindful of their culture and their mm-hmm. social norms and, and their their ways of doing things mm-hmm. uh, certainly goes a long way. It's so easy, sorry, and just it's general respect. Yes. And yes. it's not yeah. just the border, it's, it's mm-hmm. not just the immigration and the police, it. it's All everyone it. that mm-hmm. you come across. Mm-hmm. If, you, if you treat people with respect, they will treat you with respect. It's it just tends to be the case. <laughs> yeah. It tends to be the case. So the, the other side of the documentation is related to the people that are on the trip. So we need to make sure that our passport, when we enter into an idea of crossing uh, the African continent, we want to make sure we have lots of time left on our passport. Uh, If you're going to a trip, if you're going to go to Italy for a couple months and you got six or seven months left on your passport, it's probably fine. Um, But even getting into a European country with less than six months on your passport, they won't let you do that. But crossing the African continent um, can result in, there can be a lot of delays. Um, You can have a mechanical problem, you're waiting for parts, you could be in a place for quite some time. So you wanna make sure you have lots of time left on your passport, lots of empty pages on your passport. Mm -hmm. And And always get, sorry, and always get the maximum visa allowed. Yeah. Yeah. So Regardless. you could you say, oh, it. I'll just take two weeks. But if it's three months is an option, take the three months. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you never know what you may need right. a new gearbox or whatever. Yeah, well, I, yeah. I remember. <laughs> I really I love that story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, gr- it was the same for Graham Jackson mm-hmm. when he was crossing. Uh, he needed an all-new gearbox. They f- brand new vehicle. They just did not put. There was some part of the transmission that wasn't lubricated, so needed an all-new transmission Uh, so yes absolutely you want to be planning advance for your visas there are two ways to do that if you're on a very uh, regimented schedule and a fairly short one um, you can do all your visas in advance you can send them all to Washington DC if you're traveling in as an American and uh, they'll walk they'll courier your passport to all of the different consulates and they'll give you all of the 
all the visas that you need for all the countries and you kind of have them all planned out in a schedule. Um, and that is one way to do that. And the other way to do it is, as you described earlier in the podcast, where you're going to take each country at it at a time. And you're going to have to go into usually a fairly populated center and you're going to need to go into the consulate office yourself or use a service if it's trusted. And you're going to need to get the visa for the next country that you're about to go into mm -hmm. from the main city. Right. Or it might be four countries ahead. So yep. you have to be very careful with your planning and know for each country what are the requirements That's mm -hmm. right. along the entire route. Mm -hmm. You can't just yeah. wing it. Yeah, yeah, you really can't. There is the beauty of the American passport as well, uh, yeah. particularly East and Southern Africa. The only country we traveled in where we had to apply for a visa ahead of time was Ethiopia. Um, every other country we traveled in, we got re visa on arrival. So yeah, that's that's interesting. Rocked up to the border, um, and hardly uh, we. The only country that gave us really any flack was Mozambique. Um, we drove from. Iswatini, or we used to be Swaziland, into into Maz, and um, that was just we just got a grumpy immigration officer that day. I think um, any other any other day, I think we would have been. Psh, psh, psh. But um, you know, the American passport is still uh, you know if you look at the the Hanley Index, right? It's still an extremely powerful document. Yeah, that um, one, or the Japanese passports. Exactly, and yeah, we. Hardly ever anybody looked twice uh, once we opened up, you know, an American passport. And, um, yeah, and and I was surprised. I it's was surprised amazing. some of the ones that. So I did get a, a visa in advance for for Kenya and Uganda, mm. and I got to the Ugandan border and like the sweetest border control agent I have ever worked with in my entire life. And she she's educating me about their process, and she says, "You know, sweetie, like you don't." You didn't need to do that. I can give you that right here at the border. Mm -hmm. and, and, but there was no documentation at the time, so this was 2016, mm -hmm. that said that that was the case. Yeah. You had to have it ahead of time. So, and now I know that. But, yeah. um, and I think I needed the Kenyan one because I was flying into Kenya. Mm -hmm. But uh, you're right. Most of them yeah. you can get right on arrival. And, and there are different requirements, too, if you're sometimes if you're going, if you're traveling overland or if you're, yes. if you're flying. Um, there's an interesting visa that allows you to travel um, Kenya, Uganda, and Rwanda, um, kind of all on the same visa. Um, and, uh, and those things, again, like the customs requirements, are often in flux yeah, <laughs> like sure. a lot of the time. Um, so, yeah, doing your research ahead of time, but also understanding that um, it's good to follow up on that research, um, you know, because uh, sometimes it changes yeah, really the, rapidly. I find the best way to do that is... To not speak to someone who was in Kenya, if that's where you're going, two years ago, mm -hmm. you want to speak to someone who just came out of Kenya yeah. two mm -hmm. weeks ago or two mm -hmm. days ago. Um, that, I think, is the best source of information mm -hmm. for on the ground what's happening now. Yeah. I and would, then speak, sorry, speak to a, a variety of sources as well if you, as you can. Because mm -hmm. uh, not, not everyone is equally uh, talented when it comes to bureaucracy. Yeah, no question. Where some people really struggle, other people find it a breeze. Yeah. Yeah. Or they find it as like something that they look forward to. Right. <laughs> um, it's also good to know that if you're going to to like drive from Cape Town to Cairo and you, you have a, a brand new $100,000 Land Cruiser, uh, you are, for most of those countries, you, ca you do not have um, car insurance. So you may have liability insurance, mm -hmm. Um, that you secure at or near the border. Uh, but in the vast majority of cases, outside of uh, the countries immediately around South Africa, you do not have any kind of comprehensive or, um, or car insurance on your vehicle should you get in an accident. So when you, when you go into the decision to travel across the continent, there's only two choices. You can secure a, an insurance policy that applies to the asset, uh, that's purchased ahead of time, and it basically covers it for all instances, including falling off of a ship in a container. Uh, but that $100,000 vehicle to, to spend a couple months across Africa it will most likely cost seven to $10,000 for the insurance policy. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to decide, is that what's your tolerance for risk? So I think it's a really good idea to make sure when you go into the process that you recognize that you have to be able to walk away from the car. Mm -hmm. Uh, because it, um, you're most likely not going to lose your car, because you can 
document through the police department and everything the vehicle's been damaged and destroyed or whatever, uh, but you very well could lose the entire asset uh, when you're traveling across the continent. And it happens. It's very, very rare, very rare, but, very it, rare yeah. but it does happen. It, and it's bec- the speeds are lower. <laughs> yeah. People are more mindful. The speeds are lower. You know not to travel at night, so you start to remove a lot of the variables that can result in, in risk. But your vehicle being damaged in some way, highly likely. Your vehicle being totaled, highly unlikely, but we need to know that going into it. And we need to just say that, all right, that's the deal. Like we know that this car may not make it to the other end. Um, <laughs> that's something that we own. <laughs> this is why Graham and I drive old decrepit Land Rovers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which are incredibly valuable now. Yeah. Yeah. You know, right. When we bought them, they were like, yeah, okay. <laughs> right, exactly. Now we're like, wait, hang on a second. That thing yeah. might actually be worth something. Yeah. All right. So yeah. then now we're going to shift our conversation a little bit Can to, I, yes. Yeah, sorry, sorry, just to the, the bureaucracy and, and what's going on. I mean, what's quite contemporary, what's current, um, is the pandemic is still happening. Mm. Um, and as long, uh, along with all the visas, et cetera, you have to be very mindful of what are the requirements in terms of vaccinations or um, uh, negative uh, tests or sure. COVID tests, et cetera. Uh, we traveled during COVID, so we jumped through some massive hoops to make it happen. But we were very careful and uh, we were conscientious and we always got negative tests. But, yeah, that, that's another dimension that's been added on, another layer of bureaucracy, uh, which has a trail. Mm-hmm. So if you keep your record of your, your, your COVID tests or whatever, mm-hmm. you've you got to keep that in the folder because you do not know if you're going to get to a border crossing middle of nowhere and the guy's going to insist on everything for the last kind of year or whatever. So yeah, sure. it probably won't happen, but yeah. it's something that's, uh, that has to be considered. And it can change extremely quick. I remember I was in south africa when covid kicked off and the day before i left i was restricted to the Gatain province that was it like they started literally locking you down by province from within south africa right. so i thought at first i'm like this is great i'm gonna be yeah, i'm fine i'll be here for a year if i have to <laughs> and then and then it became quite draconian right. in their response to it and i'm not saying that their response was not appropriate it it, it was draconian and they were trying to control it mm-hmm. but um I went from like, oh, I'll just be going on safaris and working in Africa to like, no, this is really a bad thing. Let's get out of here. Yeah. Right, it's so, locked down. Yeah, it's lock, think lock, locked down. We thought it, we we thought we were locked down here. We were not locked down. No, here. no, no. We were there during it. They it were, was, they it were was a hard down. lockdown. Mm. They were locked down. Um, <clears throat> and what they didn't know at the time is that Africa itself wasn't really going to suffer that much. Yeah. The, the pro- projections, the pro- projections were that Africa was going to really mm. suffer. From COVID. And actually, Africa was one of the continents that suffered the least. Yeah, youthful, healthy people for the most part. Natural diets. Yeah, natural, exactly. Not a huge amount of international travel going on. Yeah, they just, they kind of brushed it off for the most part. Right. One last final thing I'll make on the border issue is that um, in East East Africa in particular, and also Southern Africa, um, at the major border crossings, um, these are like really advanced customs and immigration uh, systems. Uh, almost all of them are computerized now. Uh, the Tanzanian uh, border post uh, with Rwanda at Rusumo Falls is like the most modern and beautiful like, building I've ever been in, um, in contrast to the road outside. Uh, so, you know, th- I think this is something that um, Pete Sweetser, uh, I think whom we all know, uh, says in his border classes at Overland Expo that, you know, the job of customs is to collect revenue, right? And um, most of these countries, sometimes as a result of foreign direct investment, but also from their own, um, you know, uh, initiative, have thoroughly modernized their (laughs) customs and immigration systems. And um, we were never shaken down for a bribe. Um, We were never, um, like, you know, never encountered sort of corruption among, you know, officials at, at major border posts. So it's all very modern and, you know, advanced. Uh, the smaller border, border posts are different, right? Um, but the major ones, uh, you know, it's... Uh, and they have to be quite efficient because there's, exactly. there's a lot of commerce, it, that's, the happening commerce to, is that's happening on the East Coast intense, route. Intense, so right, yeah. intense. So I think that's something maybe people are, are surprised about. It's like, oh, wow, this is... A normal not border a post is yeah, a modern totally border. Not a is, yeah. In so. general, we actually found the customs uh, officers to be, the officers, the, the, the location itself to be 
of a higher quality than the general immigration. Yeah, but I also agree. the officers themselves, the staff were higher ed- high more had a higher education mm. and more yeah, professional. For sure. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of times uh, my biggest worry was like the customs. Mm-hmm. Uh, but actually customs tends to be a breeze compared to immigration. immigration. And there's a lot less people doing customs yeah. than immigration. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Th- those are all super important insights uh, when we when we look at doing a big trip like this. So talking about big trips, the other and the most popular way to travel up the the, the length of the African continent is on the eastern route. And as we talked about in the beginning, if you wanted to, you could drive the whole thing basically on tar. Mm-hmm. Stay um, in nice hotels. Yeah. And I was I was uh, it was just a few months ago. I was reading, and, and her name escapes me right now, and I feel so. This is so unfortunate, but 80 something year old woman drove the length of the African continent in a all wheel drive Tercel. Um, She drove from Cape Town to London and she had a friend along for most of it. So uh, I was like, she's my hero because she decided that like life was not over. She was gonna go see the world. Um, But it's in really important context that um, it is very feasible to do this trip. Mm. Um, now the thing that can change, and this is what we're going to talk about in a little bit is countries can have, um, there can be regional issues, flare ups that happen, uh, that either cause short term or very short term or sometimes relatively short term inconveniences to the traveler. But for the most part, traveling up the east of, of Africa, if you're going to go from South Africa into, let's say you want to go to the falls, you're going to go through Zimbabwe and little bit into Mozambique and Zambia and Tanzania. These are all big border crossings, really easy to move around. South Africans travel there all the time. It's very common for people to go up to Mount and Botswana and go camping for a week. Uh, you leave Joburg and your desk job and you go for just like we do. So it's very mm-hmm. common for that to happen. And things stay super efficient all the way up into Kenya. From there, things start to become a little more challenging. Ethiopia, for quite some time, was actually like the, it was the jewel of the route um, where people were so impressed and, and um, just couldn't believe how wonderful that experience was. And I don't doubt that that part of it's the same, but now it's a little more complicated to travel through Ethiopia. So let's talk a little bit about what happened with Ethiopia and kind of where things are today for the traveler. So, Steve, you want to give, or, or, or Graham, either one of you, well, give some insights? A bit of the insight of the, the, the issue in, in the Horn of Africa is you have, you have Ethiopia, Sudan, um, Egypt, and Eritrea, and Somalia is around there as well, mm-hmm. and the Nile. And Ethiopia is building dams um, on the River Nile, which is destabilizing the entire region. Uh, it is Ethiopia building the dams, mm-hmm. right? Because obviously Egypt is that's their source of water. So whoever's going to going to control the Nile yeah. controls the water, therefore the agriculture, the, the, therefore the economy is downstream. Um, and then you'll have these clashes, age-old rivalries that's been happening between the Eritreans and the Ethiopians. You have the Somalians, which the civil war is their cup of tea. Um, and so that it's just a very volatile region in general. Add to that um, is Islamic extremism. Uh, so there's a heck of a lot going on in that region. You had the South Sudan breaking away from Sudan. Um, and the, the problem there is it's, it's, it actually represents a rather small part of the entire uh, journey from Cape to Cairo, but there's no way around it. <laughs> you Okay, look. If you've got a big chunk of money and you've got some very good contacts, you can find a way around it. Mm-hmm. You can get fixes, you can get this, you can get that. Yeah, that's uh, the current way to do it through Su- right. South Sudan into Sudan. Right, and Excuse or fixes. even through Eritrea. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, there's ways to go around Eritrea. There's ferries, I think, from uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, so there are ways to do it for those who have the, the, the means um, and the courage. Um, to, to commit those expendable <laughs> assets. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's very expensive. So it's a choke point on that entire mm-hmm. route, which is forcing more and more people to go the West African route. Well, and it looks yeah. like Ethiopia has reopened borders. They're 
they are allowing tourists, well, tourists to go through. You can get a tourist visa to Ethiopia uh, now. Yeah, yes and no. Um, the, the big obstacle right now um, is uh, with overlanders with their own vehicles. So um, there's a couple of things going on. It's, it's a multi-variable issue right now in Ethiopia. And I'm actually, I'm writing an article for Exhibition Portal about this. I've been doing a lot of research and um, corresponding with folks who are on the ground right now traveling um, uh, in that region. And uh, there's two things happening in Ethiopia. One is the recent um, civil uh, conflict in the northern part of the country with the Tig in the Tigray region, um, and that's sort of an internal conflict, uh, you know, within the country. Um, and it's it's essentially a civil war, uh, and it's it's sort of calmed a little bit. There's a little bit of a um, a little bit of a, a peace right now, uh, a little bit of a ceasefire. But um, you know, over the last year, year and a half or so, it's kind of gone up and down, and um, a lot of that was sourced in the most recent governmental transition in Ethiopia, which happened just a couple of years ago. Um, and so that that whole northern region with the border with, with Sudan was basically cut off um, because it was an active war zone. Um, so that was problem number one. That is sort of calmed a little bit. The second problem, there's a major policy shift right now um, in Ethiopian customs. So uh, there was some point back in uh, October of 2022 when some overland folks came to the border. I think it was Moyale, which is the big border crossing with Kenya. And uh, the customs uh, folks wanted a 500% deposit on their vehicle um, as a customs guarantee. And 500% is a lot. Imagine the $100,000 land cruiser or something. Exactly, like right? Um, and uh, they said that you have to pay that deposit in U.S. dollars, um, and if you manage to make it to the other border to leave Ethiopia, uh, they give give it back to you in burr, which is the Ethiopian currency and has zero value anywhere other than Ethiopia. So, and you're losing, uh, you know, hyperinflation. So you're losing exactly. every single day. Exactly, and so that effectively closed all like overland borders. Um, and there's some, you know, various reasons for that. Uh, there's a lot of um, sort of historically a lot of sort of customs uh, issues in Ethiopia. People sort of getting vehicles into the country and selling them and uh, moving them around in the market without paying any kind of customs duty. So, uh, so they're not accepting a carnet at the border now. Yeah, even if you've got a carnet, they want the deposit. So. Um, there has been a, very recently some movement to um, get some workarounds. So <laughs> what's going on right now is um, you have to pay a $500 deposit um, and then uh, for the vehicle. And then uh, it's, it's really in flux. I get people telling me different amounts every day. But um, the idea is that you pay your deposit for your car if you're a tourist. And then um, you have to have a guide uh, say, for example, like you're maybe you want to travel in mainland China, you know, if you have yeah, a, a sure. guide. So now that's the status in Ethiopia. So you have to hire a guide through an agency. Um, and then it's $50 per person per day or something like that, in addition to like a flat fee on top of it. So it mounts up. You're like looking at like thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars if you want to spend any time in the country, um, which is actually a very inexpensive country to travel in. Um, so, uh, from what I understand at the moment is that the tourism sort of uh, government organization is talking with the customs office <laughs> internally. They, they have an incentive to yeah, fix that. Yeah, exactly, internally to try to figure out some different workarounds right yeah. now. Um, but it's, <clears throat> and but again, like we've discussed earlier, it's changing like constantly from like day to day essentially. Um, so there may be some like some loosening of the issue right now, but um, who knows? You know, it could be shut down again soon. Yeah, so. when it's, it's like the visa that you can get, you can get visas to Ethiopia, but that's to fly into Addis. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's correct. Um, I think maybe a solution will be like um, dealing with the right-hand drive bans in certain countries, and it might mm. be a case of having to put your vehicle on a truck. On a truck. Yeah. Uh, but then that still will have to do a TIP mm -hmm. or whatever, even if you're on a transit. So it gets complicated. Mm. Yeah, sure. There's another route. Um, I believe you can take a ferry to, to to Saudi Arabia, which is opening up to um, yeah tourists. Like Saudi is opening, yeah. Uh, but I think can you do it from Kenya? It, so it's so from it's from Port Sudan to Jeddah. Right. Um, right. 
but the problem then is like there's you essentially have to get on a container ship or a railroad or something from Jeddah to Mombasa right now is, is the question. Um, I just saw someone manage to travel from Sudan uh, through Chad, Central African Republic, and then, is it Cameroon? I think so, they went yeah. across. Really? Um, yeah, that was very recently, and they did it by vehicle, which was a, a big shock to everyone, so. Um, wow. And the uh, Italian, sorry, it was an Italian uh, diplomat that was actually killed. Yeah, that's right. Uh, just a few months ago in that very region. Yep. So, yeah. you know, it's it's really, it's risk and reward. Yeah. I mean. And another yeah. group managed to make it through South Sudan and then through the no man's land um, between South Sudan and Sudan, um, which is sort of administered by the UN right now, and then into Sudan and then on to Egypt. But um, again, yeah, that it's, looks it's like, like a, you were saying. That looks like an interesting possibility. I mean, that was where I entered South Sudan. Yeah. Was through Kadepo. Yeah, and there's a problem right now. This is area, it's sort of called colloquially the box, um, and it is this no man's land. I see that. On, yeah. on the, and it's partly as it's, um, they're fighting over, there's a lot of petroleum deposits there. So um, that border is far from settled between South Sudan and Sudan. And so there have been a few people who've managed to get through there, but it's, again, it kind of gets back to Graham's point about your tolerance for risk and how like deep your pockets are. Um, you know, sort of your average, whatever, overlander and a Land Rover, or a, you know, a GS or something like that is, may struggle. Um, so now we have, we have a lot of people who are just like going in circles around Kenya or like going around circles in, yeah. in Sudan yeah. or they're just going home. Um, yeah. And, you know, yeah, some Somalia is you know, basically impossible. They don't, there's no land crossings into Somalia right now. Um, yeah. Anyway, yeah, it's, it's, but again, you know, next week the whole thing might be yeah. resolved, right? Um, but how do you plan for that? You mm -hmm. know what I mean? That's what makes it so difficult. Is mm -hmm. next week it might change, but you you're in the middle of a five month, six month, seven mm -hmm. month journey, mm -hmm. um, and just kind of hoping that when we get there, it, it'll be okay. It's like the situation we had uh, from Kabinda going into the DRC. Mm -hmm. um, it's right. just so stressful, and you just don't know if you're going to make it. You think. Do I really have the resources, the time, and the energy to do mm -hmm. turn around and go all the way back again? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, as far as I remember, now this is, I'm, I did my research a little while ago. But that the option, let's say you're going north to south, it would be uh, via what would be like Israel into Jordan, mm -hmm. correct? Jordan into Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia, and then Saudi Arabia to get the ferry over to Africa. But then you try and get south of Ethiopia. Right, so the but then you saw the the Karnay situation with Kenya, right, yeah. and then so that might be the the more common route, and which is great now that Saudi Arabia is opening up to mm -hmm. tourism. Mm -hmm. uh, quid pro quo, no right hand drive, no right hand drive, and in no Saudi. dogs. So I guess I'm not going anytime soon. <laughs> Oh, you put little cat ears on Chewbacca. Cat ears. <laughs> <laughs> put a little play steering wheel on the other side yeah, of the right. defender. Okay. <laughs> right, gotcha. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's complicated. Yeah. Uh, so, but I mean, this is all part of the thing that you were saying, Scott, in terms of like opening yourself up to that, um, you know, flexibility, right? Um, yeah. But but it is exceptionally like hard right now, um, just because yeah, there's like Graham was saying, it's like there's, it's the choke point. Um, and Ethiopia is, yeah, beautiful and amazing. Um, and in some ways, it's very difficult to travel through, actually. Um, uh, of all the countries we traveled through in, in, in Eastern Southern Africa. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's beautiful. The food is fantastic. Yeah, um, the culture is incredible. It's, it's, this, it's, it's where this, coffee came from. Isn't yeah, it? yeah. It's this ancient, ancient, ancient culture. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really amazing. Um, but... Yeah, so uh, you know that's that's the ongoing thing, and I understand now too that Cote d'Ivoire on the west coast is also closed. Um, the land borders are closed. Uh, and I'm not. I haven't done a bunch of research on this, um, but I'm hearing it from a lot of folks who are traveling West Africa right now um, that uh, they're being just turned away uh, at the border of Cote d'Ivoire. I know there's a one couple. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Gusto Overland. Um, yeah, yeah, Robin. Yeah. So they're currently on the west coast trip, and they uh, they turned around. They're headed back to the UK. Um, because they couldn't get through Cote d'Ivoire. So, um, yeah, again, you know, things things change, right? Yeah. You gotta be prepared, like, okay, I'm gonna turn around and go home. So and Cote d'Ivoire is a really nice country. Mm -hmm. Ivory Coast is lovely. Yeah. Capital city, get Burger King. 
<laughs> a, you need that Burger King after uh, <laughs> you've earned it. It's yeah. funny. It's funny how those things, yeah. how those things do stand out. Like, yeah, <laughs> so funny. Yeah. So uh, then again, so what we're talking about these two main routes are West Africa, East Africa, and these are like literally slivers of mm. the entire continent. You have that entire central. Yeah. part of it which is a no-go zone for for most people you know there's you have explorers like kingsley holgate we were spoken about him before south african he's considered the most explored man in africa and he will go through these countries uh sponsored by land rover yeah um but he's got all the fixes he's got all the contacts he's been there he's done that you know so th- it, it kind of takes it from you, you get these different levels of overlanders now you get the you know, the couple that's uh, just going for an adventurous journey or something like that, and you get people that are more professional and more, um, it's more integrated into their lifestyle and they have a lot more connections and they have, you know, that um, they're kind of uh, the resources to invest in getting through these countries. And hopefully we can see a time in the future where that, that center opens up, you know, Chad, CAR. That'd be um, incredible, mm-hmm. wouldn't it? That is a massive, I mean, DRC, the majority of DRC is completely yeah. in North Africa, yeah. uh, Mali, Algeria. Yeah. You know, these... these, these Start like going a, back to Timbuktu. Yeah, like right. a, a dream route, you know, would be like Trans-Sahara, right? Like, Absolutely. You know. Absolutely. Um, but, I mean, yeah, who knows, right? But, like, say, for example, like, the border between Algeria and Morocco has been closed since time immemorial. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah, we, and we've, <laughs> you know? we've spent a lot of time talking about crossing the continent, but the reality is is that even to spend six months and never, never leaving mm. South Africa, uh, Lesotho, Eswatini, <laughs> like, I mean, N- Namibia, Angola, Zambia, Zimbabwe. Bots, yeah. you know, like, it's just, like, you could have... A lifetime yeah. of adventures. The scale, in those the countries. scale of the content, the scale of the continent, and is the scale of massive. the countries in it. Yeah, they're uh, absolutely massive. Are shocking in their yeah. size, right? So there's and and for those that are listening, the reason why we're talking about traveling on the African continent is because it is such a special place. Um, it is. It has the most special place in my heart of all the places that I go, and. Even if you're saying, I'm just going to go for two weeks and I'm going to have an experience in Namibia, it will be the experience of a lifetime because it, the first time you, you see an oryx walking <laughs> along the top of a sand dune, um, it's life-changing. The first time that you hear a lion roar, the first time an elephant sneaks up behind you because they're silent. They're, they're like gigantic ninjas. I don't know how they do that, but like somehow they are silent going through the bush. Um, these are experiences that are otherworldly. They are absolutely incredible, and they change you as a person. So consider traveling to the African continent. Consider doing a trip like this. Uh, talk to some people that live there, follow their stories, read their stories, and then plan your own adventure. If I could add to that, I think doing Trans Africa, East or West, it's, for some it's a feather in the cap, for others it's part of a greater world tour like it is for me i want to drive travel the whole world you know around the world i want i want to cross these continents it's very important for me to do these transcontinental journeys uh but for most people they would get a lot more out of their effort and their investment in africa specifically if they had to focus on a region Mm -hmm. and that region i in my experience where you get the most bang for your buck would be southern and touching into east africa yep um, ship into South Africa and like you said you can spend six months a year two years just going around doing that circle if you want if you want to eat giant shrimp on the beach under a palm tree you go to Mozambique uh, if you want to you know see the the oryx and the elephants and the desert lions uh, go get lost in Namibia in the mm. desert for a while you know? unbelievable it's, it's, mm. and there's everything in between you want a five star experience it's there yeah. You want absolute freedom in the middle of nowhere? It's there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, you get to choose. So ship your vehicle there or buy a vehicle there. Mm-hmm. And that's another great, I think, point about the uh, traveling in the African continent, and we all know this, is that South Africa is a very good place to buy and equip <laughs> overland vehicles. Mm-hmm. For sure. Yeah. Um, they have a lot of infrastructure for it. And the <coughs> dollar is very strong right now. Yeah. And the, the labor's cheap. Mm-hmm. Um, you look at half of the, the overland products that are on the market, and so many of those innovations and so many of those products, well-respected products are coming out of South Africa. 
you could buy yourself that defender that you've always wanted that yeah. is out of re- uh, reach in, uh, or even that Toyota Land Cruiser. Yeah. You just can't get in, like in the US. Listen Patrol, mm-hmm. you want a Unimog. You they're all there. It. They're all there. And they're yeah, affordable, I've, relatively I've affordable. I found myself the other day uh, looking at a little cabin overlooking a creek in Dolstrom. Right. And it was uh, 48000 US dollars right. for the land and the cabin and frontage of the creek. And then you spend another twenty five thousand on an old defender, and I could I could whittle away the rest of my life doing that. Right. <laughs> so. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it's an incredible place, and it is affordable to travel there. It is. If you need, if you are looking for affordable travel, it's absolutely possible. So. And particularly if you're really interested in that wildlife experience, um, you know, most of the big wildlife game parks in say Tanzania and Kenya are wildly expensive um, for foreign travelers. Um, you know. Five hundred dollars per person per day, kind of expensive, for sure, right? For sure. Whereas, um, you know, many of the game parks, national parks, and say Botswana or Namibia or South Africa, like it's um, you know arrive and drive, right? Yeah. And you have your own experience, yeah. and uh, it's uh, an order of magnitude less expensive. It's not to say it's cheap per se, but it's um, it's you can see all the same animals um, yeah. that you do in Kenya. You can see them in South Africa. You can see them. Botswana. The most incredible campsite I've ever had in my life was outside of Mound, and we had worked with a local community that had kind of its own little land in holding. Um, it was mm-hmm. not part of a park, mm-hmm. and you could get a permit to camp, wild wild camp. Mm-hmm. No fences, no chain link, mm-hmm. no locks. You drive along the trail, and you're like, this looks like a nice spot. <laughs> and you set up camp, and you start the fire, and, and you see the, you know, the hippo, and you see the you know, the giraffe are drinking and you hear the lions in the distance and, and, and the, the light had gone down and that was just the firelight. And I just got this sense that there was something like that eats people around here. <laughs> and like, you know, again, the hair that I don't have on the top and of my head. sometimes you can smell that. It, maybe yeah, that's you, what it, maybe that's yeah, what it was. Even <laughs> maybe you that's what it uh, was. And, and, you know, my good friend, Greg Miller, he was working on downloading some pictures onto his laptop very um, focused on his on his computer, and I'm like, there's something right there. And I pop my flashlight on, and there was I don't, the biggest hyena I've ever seen in my life, about 10, 15 yards behind him moving through the grass. And as soon as the light hit, he was gone, or she was, probably she, mm. a big, big one, and uh, was gone. But uh, it, it makes you feel alive. Oh, yeah. I, I, alive. I've had camps where, um, you know, step outside the vehicle or do whatever and it's just getting ready for bed and you're just settling down and then you kind of feel that and you put the, the torch on and then there's a set of eyes <laughs> and the further apart the <laughs> eyes are the, the more better. concerned you <laughs> have to be <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they're not blinking and they just focus completely on <laughs> yeah. you like yes yeah, this yeah. is my cue to get yeah. you know, behind some canvas because that will protect me. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah in, uh, in western Botswana in the far reaches of the Central Kalahari Game Reserve, there's an extremely remote campsite that was one of our favorites. And one evening, well, middle of the night, actually, we uh, were sleeping in our roof tent. And um, out of not, I was exhausted, and, but out of nowhere, I sat like bolt upright, you know, in the tent. Like I was awake and I was like, why am I awake? And I could, I could smell this like wild smell, you know, outside. Mm. And then I, then I could hear it just breathing. <laughs> and I looked, and I looked at the mesh, and then there's an eye, right? Yes. And it's an elephant, right? <laughs> and and I, I kind of look, and the whole campsite is full of elephants. <laughs> you know, and this is, you know, 2 a.m., right? Yeah. And like you were saying, they're so, you know, graceful in their movements. You know, yeah, like ninjas, s- ninjas. Stepping over the guy lines for the yeah. tents, and, yeah. you know. Uh, and then... One of them like broke a huge branch off the tree in the campsite, and of course Julie went <laughs> straight up. And, but they were there for an hour, just munching on the trees and hanging out. And yeah. but that moment when you know you're eye to eye with an elephant, it's like, so humbling. Through some mesh, right? It's yeah. uh, so it is, incredible. It is yeah. so humbling. Mm-hmm. Well, gentlemen, thank you both so much for being on the podcast and allowing us to talk about. It sounds like the three of us, our favorite place on the planet. Um, truly an exceptional spot. Um, how do people get in touch with you, Graham, if they want to follow you on social media? Um, A2A Expedition, that's A number 2A Expedition, uh, is my Facebook page. Yep. And, uh, and I'm graham.r.bell on Instagram. Nice. And then, Steve, how do people get 
in touch with you. Yeah, you bet. Um, we're, our handle on Instagram is Venturesome Overland. Um, and I've been a little quiet on there uh, in the last few months, but um, you know, I'm, I'm always checking uh, for messages. And I do love, maybe if you couldn't tell uh, during the course of this podcast, I love to talk to folks about traveling in Africa. Um, I teach classes on it at Overland Expo, so you can find me at Expo. Um, it's just a part of the world that I'm, you know, staunch advocate for. And if you're into adventure travel, there's no other place like it. Yeah. Um, and then of course, also you can find me on Expedition Portal. Um, and uh, I'm happy to touch base there as well. So. Perfect. Yeah. And you, you all can reach out to me with any questions as well. Scott.a.brady on Instagram. We thank you all for listening and we'll talk to you next time.